those who uh, who signed in on time today, why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, our webinar tonight is a little bit different. Um, uh, we entitled it "Achieving Predictable Implant Placement Immediately After a Traumatic Extraction." And um, as many of you know, I'm a, a dentist in the Detroit area. I place a, a lot of dental implants. I have a teaching program both at at our University of Detroit Mercy Dental School and I work with the Engel Institute uh, for implant training and um, one of the most important aspects of dental implants is being able to atraumatically remove teeth and, and I know a lot of dentists don't do that uh, and we'll talk about what I mean by atraumatic extractions in, in just a few moments. Um, we're going to go till about, you know about 10 to 9 today and then we'll have time for questions. Uh, just a little administrative items that I want to address. Um, if you do have any questions during the presentation, please type them in um, uh, on the bottom of your screen and we will get to them at the end of the program. Um, we'll get to as many questions as we can and hopefully we'll be able to address your, your concerns. Number two, at the end of my program today, uh, we will have a special offer from our sponsor and our sponsor tonight is Golden Dental Solutions and um, Kurt Lawler from Golden Dental Solutions will outline the process to get your CE uh, for this evening and also um, discuss some of the um, instruments and, and materials that we'll talk about tonight. And as many of you uh, already know who have, who have um, listened to our webinars in the past, uh, this program is going to be recorded and you will be sent a replay link tomorrow uh, if you want to listen to it again. So we, again, we have a big group today, and I do want to respect your time. Uh, I'm Dr. Tim Kaczynski, and tonight's um, topic is Achieving Predictable Implant Placement Immediately After a Traumatic Extractions. And our objectives are to demonstrate proven techniques to be, uh, to be able to remove teeth and also to prepare a foundation for future implant, um, implant placement. Um, we will learn about atraumatic extractions, predictable grafting techniques, I'm going to try to keep it simple, and predictable implant placement. This is not going to necessarily be an implant uh, webinar, uh, but rather I want to, to demonstrate some of the atraumatic extraction techniques that I use in my practice just about every day, and also some of the um, simple socket grafting uh, procedures that we use that all of you listening can become very competent and confident. Um, we're going to do step-by-step -step instructions on how to immediately implement uh, predictable extraction and grafting techniques in your practice, which is going to be very financially rewarding to you and also professionally reward rewarding to you. And finally, um, we'll, we'll, hopefully I'll leave you with an understanding of when implant, immediate implant placement uh, is an option and how to get these predictable results. I think um, some of our concerns um, as, as dentists are, you know, some of us don't like to remove teeth or don't feel very comfortable removing teeth. We have a tendency to refer out a lot of our, lot of our extractions and we're going to demonstrate some of the techniques that I use um, that make uh, extractions of even uh, difficult situations rather routine. And also um, grafting procedures. Um, as we all know that grafting has become a very hot topic in dentistry because our materials have become so predictable but again we need to demonstrate certain techniques that make you uh, comfortable and make the procedures very predictable. We're going to focus on two main types of, of socket grafting. One in which a tooth is removed and all the walls are intact. Therefore we have like an ice cream cone or a waffle cone uh, that we will fill with some material uh, to allow that site to heal properly. Uh, and the second technique that we will demonstrate in, in great detail is when we're missing the facial wall, when we're missing one of the walls. And with the techniques that we're going to demonstrate tonight, all of you here, if you follow the protocol uh, precisely, we'll be able to achieve the same results um, that I, I achieve just about uh, every day in my practice. So um, it's very important when you hear speakers there's a lot of materials, there's a lot of outstanding uh, clinicians and, and lecturers out there. 
But what I'm going to try to do tonight is just make it simple and discuss the products that I use in my practice that work very, very well for me in my practice. And if I'm able to, to address that and clearly demonstrate that to you, I think that uh, you too will be able to be very successful in creating very predictable results in your practice. Many of you are listening today because you're not getting predictable results. You're, you may be grafting, uh, you may be using a membrane, which we will discuss in, in, in great detail, but the membrane comes out um, after a day or two. If a membrane comes out and the grafting material, the bone is not protected, the case becomes unpredictable. And that's what we don't want in dentistry. Um, all of you are very capable in what you do. Uh, crown preparations, uh, restorations, endodontics, orthodontics, and we need to get you into a comfort zone um, as far as extractions and grafting procedures. Um, as an evaluator, I get to work with a lot of different products, and um, I've learned over the years what's worked best in my hands and what has not worked well in my hands. And I'm going to share with you simply the, the materials and products that have worked very well in my hands. And what's most important is the clinical results um, and predictability. You're going to hear me say that uh, constantly throughout the, the uh, program today. And we're going to try to allow you to get the best results possible with materials that, that I use, that I feel comfortable with. And we have to realize that things are changing very fast in dentistry. And, and learning new techniques and new procedures, I think, are going to be uh, to your advantage. I love technology, but I only have technology in my practice that I use. Um, I don't like buying things that, that sit, sit um, in, in a tray or sit in the corner. Um, and one of the reasons why um, I like Golden Dental Solutions so much, number one, they're a Detroit-based company, but they respect your time and energy. Um, they have outstanding educational programs. Um, we do uh, two, two programs at the University of Detroit Mercy Dental School an extraction program where um, uh, we may see 85 patients as a group and then we have a grafting hands-on grafting on live patients where we may as a group see 60 or 65 patients so it's a great way to learn um, the techniques that we're going to demonstrate uh, with slides today um, Again, this is not going to be a how to place implant program, but I am going to show you clinical cases so that you can see the end result in some of the, the cases that, that, um, that we've done. And again, I think everything that I'm going to show you, um, if you follow the recipe, the, the techniques that we demonstrate, you too can achieve these same predictable results in your practice. Um, we're going to talk about immediate implant placement. We have um, you know, questionnaires at the end of our webinars. This is one topic that um, has always um, given us a lot of questions and um, requests for more information on how do we remove a tooth and then place an implant immediately. I do that routinely in my practice. That's something that I feel very comfortable with. Um, and so let's demonstrate these techniques and, and hopefully we'll help you um, um, help your thought process in developing these skills in your in your everyday practice. Obviously you need to know your own limits and you have to invest in proper training. I think that that live patient demonstration, if you're able to actually work on a patient with a mentor dentist uh, behind you, I think there is tremendous advantage to and again um, one of the programs that I'm involved with is the Engel Institute um, and you can get online and, and look that up, E-N-G-E-L. Uh, but again, it's a program where we provide you patients and you'll actually place implants in, in our patients. Um, the intent of this evening is to demonstrate extraction and grafting techniques to have better implant results. It's, uh, well, I know it's fall, but um, I know my wife will, as soon as the, the winter breaks here in Detroit, she'll be thinking of her, her garden. And there's a lot of preparation that goes into the beautiful flowers um, that we have in the late summer and early fall uh, here in Michigan. And so that's the same thing that, that we'll discuss. We're setting a, we're setting a good foundation um, um, for a beautiful result at the end. Um, so let's ask yourself this question. Um, if you can't do extractions, will you be doing 
the grafting and the implants? And the answer is no. So we have to start with very, very predictable, competent extraction techniques. We've all heard of the dentist that puts his knee on the chest. Uh, we all have gone through the process, including myself, in, in removing very difficult teeth where we're, we're sweating up a storm. Um, it's late in the evening, uh, late in the night, and our spouse uh, has dinner plans with our friends, and we're digging out root tips. And so um, working with uh, the instruments that I'm going to demonstrate briefly tonight, um, I have found that, that my stress level has been reduced dramatically, and I'm also saving my body. I think it's very important that as we all get older, we save our eyes and our backs and our, our muscles and our hands. And techniques that, tools that make us more proficient are good tools to use. Um, why aren't you, if you're not doing extractions, why aren't you comfortable with it? Well, most of us will say because we have bad results um, or we, we damage a lot of bone, we harm the patient. So we're talking about atraumatic extractions. And what does atraumatic mean? Atraumatic extraction means it's atraumatic to the patient, right? We want our patients to have a good experience. We want them to, to tell their friends, hey, this dentist is really good. We, we do painless injections and we remove teeth without a lot of force and pulling and tugging. Number two, atraumatic to the bone. Bone to me is gold. As an implant dentist who places uh, over 1,100 implants a year by myself in, in the Detroit area, um, I think it's uh, maintaining the, the quality and quantity of bone is very important. So maintaining the facial plate of bone is pretty darn important. And finally, a traumatic, and finally, a traumatic to myself or to the dentist. We want to reduce our stress levels. We want to save our body, save our hands, save our back, save our eyes, and learn techniques that make us more proficient. Um, if you are grafting, grafting is very popular. You may have taken courses, but maybe you're not getting predictable results and you get frustrated, as we all have. Um, you, you try to put a, a material into a socket and you go back at its future date and it hasn't healed, it hasn't regenerated into bone. We know, we tell our patients that bone is alive in the body. The body's bone constantly changes over. Um, we know as, as dentists that in, when we put a graft material or an implant into the jawbone, osteoclasts will invade and eat away the bone around the graft material or around the implant and simultaneously different cells, as we know them as osteoblasts, will lay down new bone. So this is a process. But we also know how a socket heals. A socket heals from the apex towards the crest. And so it's imperative that we protect whatever material we use, whatever material you choose to use, we have to protect the crestal um, uh, grafting material from invagination of soft tissue. Epithelium grows 10 times faster than bone. And so we have to protect that crustal graft material from invagination of soft tissue. Those are the techniques that we have to demonstrate today. You know your patients want you to treat them in the office. They look at you and they go, come on, doc, can't you just do this? They don't want to go through the referral process. Obviously, the referral process is very important. It's very important to me um, in, in my practice. But there are things that you, as general dentists, are certainly capable and competent enough to provide your patients as long as you have the proper training. You have to get involved. You have to educate yourself. So it all starts here with proper extraction and grafting techniques. Then you have a good foundation for future implant uh, placement. We're going to do this. I'm a very clinically oriented. I'm a wet finger dentist. Um, um, I, I treat a lot of patients and we try to document as many we, as patients as we can with our photographs and with our video. Uh, we have a lot of uh, YouTube information out there if you want to check us out. So let's look at some clinical cases and uh, I think it's probably the most helpful in, in this type of situation. So let's look at extractions and grafting. Our first case, we're going to extract a tooth, we're going to graft, and we're going to immediately place an implant. Let's see what we can do. So this patient was referred to me um, with a non-restorable, uh, horizontally fractured maxillary cuspid tooth. Maxillary cuspid tooth. Crown work on either side of the space. Patient has made a big investment. Little perio problem. You can see the inflammation around that cuspid tooth. We want to remove this tooth atraumatically. And some of us may say, well, this is a difficult tooth to remove. And it is. 
using our conventional techniques. I would assume most of us out there um, would take a periotome or a periosteal elevator and kind of cut around the periodontal ligament, cut around the tooth. And then I would assume that many of us would take some type of elevator or luxator to try to get that, that root to move a little bit. And then we would take an anterior forcep and we would grab onto that tooth as hard as we could, squeeze and rotate. Rotate buccal lingual or facial lingual or figure eight or however we were trained. The problem that we have is when we have a root canal treated tooth with a horizontal fracture, oftentimes we fracture the root. A root tip is left. And then we take an inordinate amount of time trying to get a root tip out. And more importantly, we damage the bone. We take a high speed burr and we're removing very valuable bone from that site. So what other techniques do we have? We're going to remove this non-restorable, damaged, maxillary cuspid tooth, the longest tooth in the mouth. And if you look, don't we all love posts out there? We have a, a horizontal fracture along the post line. And you, if you look clearly, if you look closely at that x-ray, you'll see a horizontal fracture right where the um, post is and where the finished root canal fill uh, is, is um, present. So this could be a difficult extraction. Now we have the Vatec CBCT in our office and, and what's nice about this uh, piece of equipment is we can actually take single units um, that are very, very accurate. And if we look at the three, third dimensional image of this tooth, again I'm doing this for educational purposes, number one we can see a fracture and number two, more importantly, the facial plate of bone is extremely thin. And that's what we're concerned about as dentists. We're concerned about root tips and we're concerned about fracturing that facial plate of bone, which is extremely thin in that area. So in my hands, in my practice, I use the golden physics forceps. And again, at the end of the program, I'll let the, the uh, Kurt uh, Lawler from Golden Dental explain um, uh, anything that, that he needs to explain about the, the instruments. But it is a tool that consists of two components. It consists of a beak, which is like a shovel-shaped edge, which will engage the lingual or palatal aspect of the tooth, one to three millimeters subgingival. It is the only working end of the instrument. The bumper, which has a green silicone sleeve on it, is placed as high up or as down low into the vestibule as possible. And, but that is not the working end of the instrument. That is simply a fulcrum. It is a center of rotation that allows tension to be created on the palatal aspect of this tooth and allows with simple wrist movement. There's no squeezing of, of the handles here. This is not a conventional forcep. So there is a learning curve here. We're simply putting pressure or tension onto the paddle, palatal aspect of this root, allowing the instrument to be rotated along the arc of the physics forcep. And you can see how it's a kind of a U-shaped form. Again, the bumper is not holding the facial plate of bone. It is simply a center of rotation that allows us to create tension on the palatal aspect of this root. Why is that important? Well, it's a physiologic response. This tension on the palatal aspect of the root is going to create an, uh, the, it's going to have the body create an enzyme which is going to break down the periodontal ligament. Well, what's holding this tooth in place? The periodontal ligament. If the periodontal ligament is destroyed, Theoretically, that tooth will come up and out of the socket. And again, I'm not squeezing this instrument. It's not a conventional forcep. So trauma to the, the fractured apices of that root is, may not happen as it would with conventional extraction techniques. So I've placed the beak in this photograph on the palatal aspect. I've placed the bumper as high up the vestibule as possible. It is a fulcrum or center of rotation. I'm simply rotating my wrist towards the corner of the eye, not squeezing the instrument. And in a matter of seconds or maybe a minute or so, the tooth will pop. You won't hear it pop, 
but the tooth will release because the periodontal ligament has been melted away by hyaluronidase, which is the physiologic response of the body to tension. I, I guess it would be similar if you took a, a luxator and slowly luxated the tooth back and forth for 20 minutes or so, creating the same amount of tension. But this is a, an instrument where I can remove the tooth atraumatically to the bone. I'll show you that in a minute but atraumatically to the patient, where the patient looks at you like, wow, you really took that tooth out? You must be really, really good at this because extractions can be very, very difficult to our patients. The instrument is not intended to remove the tooth in total. Rather, it's intended to move the tooth up and out of the socket. It's, I will then take what we call a tooth delivery instrument and simply rotate the, what's left of the tooth up and out of the socket and you see the curvature of that cuspid tooth. The tooth was removed without breaking the, without breaking the apices where it was fractured. It's maintained the facial plate of bone. It's maintained the interceptal bone. Interceptal bone is very important to maintain the interdental papilla. So this is an atraumatic extraction. Atraumatic to the bone, atraumatic to the patient, and really a traumatic to the doctor. For education, I took another um, single unit CBCT, and you, I wanted to show you, I wanted to demonstrate that that facial plate of bone is indeed intact. But look at the root structure, look at the socket uh, design here. Um, the socket, the root was actually angled towards the facial aspect of the, of the mouth. That's not where we're going to put our implant, everybody. This is, um, um, we're going to place, do an immediate implant here, and I'll demonstrate that in a second. What here I wanted to show you was that we have a very thin facial plate of bone. But even to demonstrate that further, here, a, a periapical radiograph really isn't going to show too much. But what, what are we able to achieve here? We're able to maintain that facial plate of bone. So in this situation, we're going to make our osteotomy on the palatal aspect of the socket. We do not follow the socket site precisely. Rather, we have to engage the, the palatal wall. And we're going to engage the, the palatal wall, and we're going to extend uh, past the apices of the root. We need initial stability when we're doing immediate implants. Now there's a lot of different materials that we can use when we're doing um, socket grafting. In this situation, we're going to use a mineralized cortical cancellous allograft. Allograft means from another human. It's this, uh, the design here is it's in a, in a putty form, meaning it's in a syringe. Um, and we're going to be able to, to fill the, the site. And what I'll tell my patients is um, when we take a tooth out, we create a socket, and that socket is shaped like an egg. Our implants are round, so there's a void between the edge of the implant and the, the uh, facial wall, so to speak. So we're going to fill that area with our bone material, which is like caulking. Now remember, it's very important when you're explaining to your patients, this is not concrete that we're pouring in there. Whatever we put into a socket is going to reorganize and regenerate into the patient's own bone in a very short amount of time. Uh, and it's important that you explain it to them. Another material that I use quite frequently is um, tricalcium phosphate uh, from Curasan. It's called Cerasorb. You can also get this from Golden Dental Solution. Uh, so that's another material that I'll demonstrate um, uh, throughout the evening today. And finally, we're going to talk about probably the most convenient way of, of grafting a simple socket is with an osteogen plug. An osteogen plug is a very specially formulated, formulated non-centered calcium and phosphorus combination uh, in a, 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 a bovine Achilles tendon matrix. And it, it's been used in Europe for, for, for many, 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 many years. And we've been using it for about two years. I've done a lot of histologic evaluation. And sure enough, we are regenerating bone in a very, very fast amount of time. So let's keep it simple tonight. Let's talk about three materials. Here is the mineralized cortical cancellous 
bone allograft material, human bone, uh, very safe, FDA approved, um, that will be used as a caulking mechanism, which will allow osteoclasts to eat it away and osteoblasts to lay down new bone in its place. So here I wanted to demonstrate, um, I showed you that, that the CBCT where I had a very thin facial plate of bone, but to even demonstrate this further, I made a little envelope flap. I wanted you to see that I was able to pull the tissue away and the facial wall is basically intact here. Now we may have a small dehiscence at the very apices of that um, socket. You saw the curvature of that root when we took it out and that bone is very, very thin. So we are going to use a membrane. A membrane is used to protect the graft material, again, from invagination of epithelium. And it's very important that it be placed correctly. Now, basically, there are two types of, of um, membranes or barriers to speak of. There's resorbable, meaning the body will eventually eat it away, or non-resorbable. And there's certain rules that we, we, the literature will tell you when we can get primary closure within two millimeters. Um, you can use a resorbable material. The literature will say if you don't get primary closure within two millimeters or the closure is two millimeters or more, uh, the literature will say use a non-resorbable material, meaning something that you have to remove uh, after a period of time. We're going to talk, again, to keep it simple, I told you we're going to keep it simple, is I use a product called EpiGuide, again, from Curasan and available with Golden Dental Solution. It is a specially formulated, very long-lasting, resorbable membrane. And if you're going to have one membrane in your practice, this is probably the one to have. I've had great luck with it. Um, uh, it's my primary membrane uh, in my practice. And the reason I like it is because it is long-lasting. It will last up to eight weeks, um, it, it even open to the environment. So. Normally, if I was using a non-resorbable membrane, I would remove it in six weeks following surgery anyways. So I have a membrane that eventually will be resorbed away by the body, but lasts a long time because of its special formulation, and it allows me to, to have a membrane that, that protects my graft material uh, during that initial important changeover into bone. So if you want one membrane, this is the one I recommend. Very, very important when we're using a membrane, regardless of what type, let me back up for a second. When you're talking to any sales rep, it's imperative that you know how long that membrane that they're selling you lasts. If they don't know, I wouldn't buy it, okay? Uh, there are collagen membranes that last three or four days. That's not going to help you at all. So you want a long-lasting membrane. It's imperative that the placement of the membrane be precise. I mentioned in the very beginning that I was going to teach you predictable techniques. What does that mean? It means we're going to place our membrane so that we can maximize the protection of whatever graft material we use. We need to place our membrane minimally two millimeters beyond any defect. I'm going to repeat that because this is very important. Regardless of the membrane, you have to place it at least two millimeters beyond any defect. If you are missing the facial plate of bone, six millimeters of it, how far down do you have to place that membrane? At least eight millimeters. That's the biggest mistake I think that we as clinicians make is we have a tendency to not elevate that tissue or flap the tissue away so that you can see the defect and so we try to force our membrane into position. We get frustrated and then we just lay it on top. Laying it on top is not going to work. If it comes out before the, the, the material starts to, um, to change over, you don't have a predictable result. And third time I've said this now, I want you to have predictable results. So here we've taken our membrane and I've placed it beyond that small little de dehiscence I had in the bone in the facial aspect. I'm going to take my allograft material. It's in a syringe form. I've already done my osteotomy, by the way. Again, this is not an implant training program. 
osteotomies, meaning I have a small burr to a larger burr to a larger burr, until I decide the, the tight size of implant that I want, the length and the width. Remember I said we're not placing our implants directly into that socket site, rather we're placing it palatal, we're engaging the palatal wall, and we need initial stability. If we want to do an immediate implant, we need initial stability of that implant in place. So here we're grafting. You can see what the particles look like. The membrane is on the facial aspect. I'm simply going to thread my implant into position, um, place it, and I'm going to cover my membrane over the top of this ridge. Very, very important. I also have to, I also have to place my membrane so that it engages at least two millimeters of palatal bone. That membrane is laying passive. It's not going to go anywhere. And for those of you who have tried grafting, have taken courses from different doctors, and you try to use a graft, and you try to use a membrane, but the membrane comes out when you're suturing or comes out in a short amount of time when you do suture removal, again, the case becomes unpredictable. Very important slide here. Look at my suturing technique. We use reverse, reverse cutting needles. And so I'll have my staff simply um, very gently hold my membrane in place. And I'm, I'm taking my needle and I'm engaging from the crest to the facial aspect. Most of us would probably go to, from the facial to, to the center of the ridge. And that's where we grab onto our membrane. So go from the crest to the facial aspect, turn the needle around, then go from the crest to the palatal aspect. That way you're not going to grab onto that membrane and it'll lay flat. Here we're showing the palatal aspect. Go from the crest to the palatal. And I'm simply making some cross sutures. You can see that membrane. I don't have primary closure there. But I'm using a long-lasting membrane that will allow uh, epithelium to grow on top. But it will protect the allograft and the implant beneath it. Did a post-operative uh, CBCT again for education. And look at my positioning of my implant. It is palatal to the socket. I did not follow that socket site directly and I've engaged bone apical to that socket depth. I have initial stability of that implant. The facial aspect is allograft, is grafted material. In a very short amount of time, that will turn over to the patient's own bone. After four months of healing, you can see I have good attached gingiva on the facial aspect. I will use a tissue punch and expose the top of the implant make our impression. We use the Kettenbach uh, impression material, and uh, Kurt can probably explain this to you um, at the end. Uh, it is um, polyvinyl siloxane material. Uh, they sell direct. Kettenbach, K-E-T-T-E-N-B-A-C-H. Um, probably will save you 30 to 35 percent over your conventional polysiloxanes. As a dentist, if I'm using a high-quality uh, German product, that I feel very comfortable with. I use it every day in my practice. Um, take an impression, something that I'm going to throw out when I'm done with it. It's a smart investment. Um, here we're using the Panacil light body. And we will then, as many of you know, after the implant integrates, we make our impression. We fabricate a, um, an abutment. An abutment is like a top hat that will engage inside the implant. And here we fabricated a nice uh, Bruxer crown that is probably healthier than the other crowns in the mouth. So we're able to achieve these results very predictably with excellent results. When am I comfortable with immediate placement? Now, I do a lot of extractions, atraumatic extractions. I love to maintain the facial plate of bone, but we're not always able to do that. It's very important that you be able to get initial stability of your immediate implant. If you cannot, if you, for whatever reason, the socket's too large or you did damage bone, then I would suggest that you graft the site, allow it to heal for four to five months, and then place your implant ideally. Maxillary molar teeth. I never do an immediate uh, implant in a maxillary molar. We know that maxillary molars have three roots, mesial buccal, distal buccal, and palatal. And I find it very challenging to place that implant exactly where I want it. So I will remove that tooth, graft it, allow it to heal, and then ideally place my implant um, in, in, into the proper position. 
Let's look at another case. Uh, we're going to do several extractions, graft and immediate implants. Here we have two teeth that were deemed non-restorable, were symptomatic to the patient. Some problems with it. You can see the, the periodontal issues around those teeth. Um, this is a great tool. Again, you can talk to Kurt uh, at Golden Dental at the end of the program today on um, a product called Vibraject. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, it's a great little instrument. It's a little vibrating um, tool that will be placed onto your existing syringes and it vibrates the needle. Uh, many of us, you know, shake, shake the lip before we do an extraction, but and we do that because the motor, the motor sensation is much faster to the brain than pain sensation. And so what this Vibraject does is it uh, vibrates the needle. And I'm going to honestly tell you that about 80% of my patients um, notice a significantly reduced um, uh, discomfort in our initial injection. So it's something else that you may want to, uh, to look into and, and possibly invest into. Uh, my staff has this on every syringe. Every time I do an in injection in my practice, it's a wonderful, wonderful tool. So again, same technique. We're going to use the Golden Physics Forcep. I'm going to engage the, the um, palatal aspect of this root, one to three millimeters subgingival, place the bumper as high up the vestibule as possible, rotate my wrist towards the corner of the eye, not squeezing the instrument, rather letting energy build up, the tooth will stop, start coming up and out of the socket. This is a very important photograph. Do you see how that tooth is coming up and out of the socket? It's actually following the arc of the instrument itself. It's not intended to remove the tooth in total. Rather, it's intended to luxate it. I will then take a tooth delivery instrument and simply remove the root of the teeth uh, atraumatically. And even in the uh, second bicuspid that has a buccal and a lingual uh, buck, uh, buck a facial and a palatal root, I'm able to very, very um, comfortably remove those teeth with very little trauma, atraumatic to the patient, atraumatic to me. Now, we have to really consider the situation. Is this a site that you want to place an immediate dental implant? I think it's imperative that you evaluate the facial plate of bone first. Um, in this situation, when we curetted, we noticed that there was some facial wall defects in this site. Not caused by the extraction, but rather caused by the, the, the trauma uh, to the non-restorable teeth. So here I'm taking a, a simple Orban knife, and I'm going to make a very uh, clean incision. We call this an envelope flap. Um, no vertical incisions, and you can see the, the significant facial defect. Not caused from the extraction, but for caused from the fracture of the, of the teeth. Again, it's imperative that you feel comfortable in making these type of flaps so that you can, you can see the defect. You have to be able to see beyond the defect because remember, your membrane has to extend minimally two millimeters beyond the defect. Both facial and lingual and palatal. Here we're using the Han technique and we're going to um, uh, make our osteotomy into the bone to create initial stability. We widen our osteotomy and here I'm threading my implant into position. We're torquing it to 45 newton centimeters. That's tremendous initial stability. The first implant is ideally placed in bone. Uh, when we're placing an implant into a socket, uh, we want to, the literature will tell us, we want to go subgingival about a millimeter because again physiologically bone will resorb um, uh, to that level so we want to go into the socket slightly. I'm able to do the same thing with with the second implant but you can clearly see that we don't have a facial wall here. You can see the threads that are, are present in those implants and I'm telling you that I feel very very comfortable grafting this site placing a membrane properly, as we discussed, and allowing the site to heal and having a facial wall built. We can do this predictably today. We have our defect. This is our allograft in a powder form that we will wet with sterile water or sterile saline. We cut our membrane, our epiguide, to proper length and width. Remember, we have to extend it beyond the defect. 
fold it over so that it's passively placed. Here we're placing our epi guide, and the epi guide does have two sides. It has a smooth side and a roughened side. We want to always place the smooth side towards the bone. Um, this allows the, the roughened side for the epithelium to attach to it, which allows it to lay, lay flat during the entire healing period. So the membrane is now creating my facial wall. I'm then taking my allograft material, my powder that I've mixed with sterile water, sterile saline, so it kind of forms into a gel. I'm passively placing my membrane onto the palatal aspect of our defect and using the same suture technique that I discussed earlier, you can see that we get closure, not complete closure, because I need attached gingiva on the facial aspect. I need attached gingiva on the facial aspect of these teeth. The implants are placed. After four months of healing, we're going to take our impression. These are simple impression posts, uh, impression copings with the Han system. You can see my facial wall is intact. We have attached gingiva. We have a beautiful, healthy situation. We're using our Kettenbach medium body um, uh, polyvinyl siloxane material. We'll then use our heavy body to make our nice, crisp, clean impression of our implants. Our dental laboratory will then fabricate custom abutments. And I want you to look at my margins here. My margins are at or slightly subgingival. At or slightly subgingival with my margins. We have a healthy, clean situation, and we're able to fabricate two nice Bruxer crowns for our patient. They fit well. We do platform switching. Uh, with this system and we get a nice nice result. Uh, let's talk about graft instrumentation because um, that's something that that we we have to address. Um, I know you all have instruments but I think it's imperative that if you're going to to use um, these techniques you have a kit ready to go and so what we've done is we've put together instruments um, at a very cost-effective high-quality US made USA made uh, product that will make your job easier and um, uh, cost, cost effective. And I think you only need these 10 instruments as a kit. We designed it to make it easier for you. First you need a curette, a sharp curette. And you can see these are ionized. I, I, <laughs> they're, they're coated um, so that um, they're very long lasting. You can't use a curette that you use in dental school that's dull. You want a kit, you want curettes that are sharp, that are going to remove any granulation tissue from a socket site. Remember we're talking about extraction, grafting, and immediate implant placement. Anything that's purple blood or uh, grungy tissue, you have to get out. So you curette, 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 curette. We have a spoon and a packer that will help you not only place the graft material to the site, but also pack the material. Now when you're packing, we don't want to pack like amalgam. Rather, you want to pack firmly. You don't want to crush the particles. Our mineralized cortical cancels particles range from 250 to 1,000 microns, and that allows a, a, um, a differentiation in the resorption process, which is a stronger process. We have a uh, periosteal elevator and that Orban knife that I showed you, which is a a blade that is used to help me uh, very easily go around teeth, make my incisions, and create that envelope flap that I demonstrated twice. We have a, uh, a little carrier for your graft material so you can mix it. We have a bone file. I think it's important to have a bone file in any kit to remove any spicules. We give you a high quality pair of scissors um, and a needle holder. Now this is a cost-effective needle holder. There's a lot of fancy ones out there, but to keep the, the cost reasonable, this will work very, very well in your hands. We have a uh, tissue forcep, which allows us to, to hold the tissue, and a scalpel blade holder. And we uh, keep it in a nice um, cassette that is, um, if you're going to do a, a extraction grafting procedure, you ask for the particular physics forcep that you want to use, you ask for your grafting kit, and you're ready to go in your practice. So let's keep moving on. We have another 10 minutes or so before we go through questions. So I'm going to move through this a little bit quicker. We're going to extract 
and graft and place an implant. We have a tooth, again, that was deemed non-restorable. We have a periodontal defect on the distal aspect of this tooth. Uh, again, don't we all love posts? We have a, a horizontal fracture which is causing that periodontal problem. So we want to remove this tooth as atraumatically as possible. We, you can see the, the little bit of pus coming from the facial aspect. How did we, where do we place the in, instrument? Place the beak on the palatal aspect, one to three millimeters subgingival. Place the bumper as high up the vestibule as possible. It is a fulcrum. It is the center of rotation of the arc of the instrument itself. I'm not squeezing the instrument, rather simply rotating my wrist. The tooth will pop. You won't hear it, but it'll disengage. We take our tooth delivery instrument and we remove that tooth, maintaining the interceptal bone. Interceptal bone is, is important to maintain interdental papilla. Our, our uh, periapical radiograph doesn't show us too much. It shows us the defect in the socket, but it also shows the amount of interceptal bone that's still available. You correct. What does this show? We don't have a facial wall. Okay, doctors, we don't have a facial wall. What are we going to do? We're going to take our Orban knife, and we're going to make that envelope flap. We have our allograft material. We wet it to make it into a gel. We cut our membrane to the proper size, measure twice, cut once. We can wet it. I'm taking my Orban knife, going around the teeth. I have complete control, complete control, and I'm elevating the flap where? So that I can see the entire defect. we got to go beyond it. You have to be aggressive here, doctors. You can't baby this tissue. Be kind to it, but pull that tissue away so that you can see the defect in total. We're going to go ahead and um, use our, our, again, this is not an implant program. We're going to make our osteotomy site. We're engaging the palatal aspect, about three millimeters palatal to the facial aspect of the adjacent teeth. We're going to widen our osteotomy, widen our osteotomy, and place our implant. Again, we're going to torque it into position, about a millimeter subgingival. Here I'm simply putting a cover screw on, but I want what I want to demonstrate here is that our threads are definitely exposed. We do not have a facial wall here, but again, if you follow the simple rules that we're demonstrating, you will be able to predictably get the results that I get. The membrane is acting as your new facial wall. I'm placing my graft material, covering it over, suturing it into position, and allowing it to heal. We, are, we have micro suture. We had a little flipper appliance, and you can see one week post-op, you can see the membrane. You can see the tissue starting to cover over. I will remove those sutures. This is what it looks like after four months. The implant's healing. The tissue's healing. We will uncover it. We will allow the, the uh, area to heal. You can see the nice tissue cuff created. Here we're placing a zirconia abutment into position. Again, look at how I do my margins. In all my courses, all my prosthetic courses that I teach with Glidewell Laboratory or with Engel Institute, you're going to see I'm very consistent. My margins are at or just slightly subgingival. We're in ideal position and we're able to fabricate a fairly nice aesthetic emerging crown in a very difficult situation. You too can achieve this. One of our final court cases here, we have another tooth that we're going to remove, non-restorable. And when we have teeth like this, let me back up for a second. When we have teeth like this, it can be very, very difficult to remove. We have crowns on either side. So um, Golden Dental and, and Dr. Aaron Nazarian, who I, I teach with, created uh, this set of three instruments, and they refer to these as separators. Um, most of us use periotomes at one point, but they're kind of flimsy and they bend. So this is an instrument that uh, is kind of a combination between a periotome and a luxator. A uh, very, very solid piece of instrument which allows me to, to, um, to place the instrument between the root and the bone and actually separate it to some degree, get some luxation. We also have a, a bayonet that um, is used to 
uh, actually it can be used to elevate it. It has little teeth on it. can be used to elevate the tooth out of position. Very well designed, very high quality instruments. And you can see there's barely no root there. And what I'm doing is I'm shoving this instrument between the root and the bone and actually separating the root from the bone. And I'm using it. Then I'll take my little, little bayonet and I'm able to elevate it a little bit, get a purchase point with my physics forcep, not squeezing the instrument, and simply removing a very, very difficult tooth very, very atraumatically. Uh, we grafted it, we put some sutures, we placed our implant, and we're able to restore that in a very, very short amount of time. Osteogen plug, the last thing that I wanted to show you, again, um, is uh, can be purchased through Golden Dental. It is a non-sintered calcium phosphorus material in a bovine Achilles tendon matrix. It's a very unique product. I would strongly suggest you use it only when you have all the walls intact, when you truly have a socket or a waffle cone or an ice cream cone. Um, but we're able to, uh, here's a tooth that we want to remove and eventually place an implant in that area. So we're going to use the physics forcep. I'm going to remove the tooth and we have a tremendous defect. Curette the area, curette, 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 curette. We now have a socket. Now there's different protocol. I showed you several protocol where we made a flap and we uh, placed our membrane. Remember I said that membrane has to be placed passively. Um, but when we have all the walls intact, you can simply take this, this plug, this is a large plug, and place it into the socket and it actually forms into the socket. Pack it down with your plugger. I will place a couple sutures in the area. Same technique to kind of hold it in position. Now, because of the consistency of this material, we don't have time to go through all the science, the epithelium will not grow into this material. Bone heals from the apex towards the crest. So it's a race. And this material prevents invagination of the soft tissue into, a, uh, uh, into the porous graft, into the, into the graft as it would uh, when you had a porous material like the allograft. So in a short amount of time, this is what it looks like immediately post-op, but it's radiolucent, but over a period of three, four, five months, it'll become radiopaque and it'll look more like the natural tooth and allow me to place an implant um, uh, in the future. This is a product that's just been a dream for me. Again, I've done a lot of histologic evaluations and I'm very, very impressed that we do get bone, bone formation. So physics forcep allows me to atraumatically remove teeth. I talked about three different graft materials. We talked about allograft, mineralized cortical cancellus, 250 to 1,000 microns. We talked about tricalcium phosphate, which is a synthetic material. We talked about osteogen, which were the plugs. You want to make sure that you have the correct set of instruments on hand. You can't do this work without having proper instruments. You should be treating sockets where all the walls are intact, but you can also predictably repair a facial defect with proper techniques. Again, everything that we've demonstrated here in this quick 50 minutes, um, it, I know we went very fast, um, can be demonstrated on live patients through one of our programs, and you can get that information from Kurt Lawler in a few minutes. You can do these cases, and you can do it very predictably, but you have to follow the recipe. You can't skip steps. You have to feel comfortable with the products. You have to take your time, respect tissue, respect bone, Respect your own body. Atraumatic to the patient, atraumatic to the bone, atraumatic to the doctor. So um, what, I, what I'd like to do is turn this over to uh, Kurt and, and Brian, and uh, I'm sure there's some questions that need to be answered. I did go through this rather quickly. And then, uh, Kurt, if you want to take some time, and, and I think you have some specials uh, for those who have bothered to listen today, I'll let you do that.
All right, hello everybody. Uh, this is Kurt Lawler from uh, Golden Down Solutions. Let me just get my um, slides up here and I will get started. I'm just going to speak um, for a, a few minutes here. Uh, I want to save some time for the question and answer session. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed the program this evening. Uh, thanks, Dr. Krasinski, for the program. Um, another great demonstration of clinical cases and, and hopefully everybody appreciated it. So um, really quickly, um, there's some questions I saw that came in. People are asking, you know, what are the physics forceps set? And I know Dr. Kaczynski demonstrated the technique, and um, I know a lot of you on the on the program this evening that join us on a regular basis um, are using the physics forceps. But let me just clarify kind of what they are real quick. We have the standard series set. Um, which consists of, of four instruments. So you have three uppers and one lower. So you have a lower universal, upper right, upper left, and an upper interior. For anybody that has never tried or used our product uh, for the physics forceps, this is the set of instrumentation um, that you would want to start with. You get the best leverage, they're the easiest to use, and for the most part, they cover the full mouth with the exception of uh, third molars. And in some patients, depending on the access in the mouth, uh, the second molar area uh, could be challenging to access in, in some instances. That's what this set is for. This is called the molar series set of two instruments. This is for, um, like I just said, erupted third molars and hard to reach second molars that you cannot access with the standard series. This set is more of a, an accessory to the standard series. It serves the purpose of going further back or posterior into the mouth. However, you do lose a little bit of your leverage that you would gain with the instruments in the standard series um, that I just showed you with the green bumpers. So those are the two sets. Um, I just wanted to clarify that. Um, Quickly, these are the separators. This is uh, new for us. We've had these for um, a few months now. They've been actually very popular. Um, Dr. Nazarian uh, helped us uh, design the separator instruments. And people ask us often, do you, do you need to elevate and advance with the physics forceps? And, and generally, the answer is always going to be no, because the physics forceps are the elevator. It's not a forcep, as Dr. Kaczynski said. It's simply a uh, lingual elevator, so it's not a forcep. However, in some instances for doctors like um, Dr. Kaczynski or Dr. Nazarian that do place a lot of implants and want to be um, extra careful in very difficult cases, this is a great pre-step to start the atraumatic extraction process prior to using the physics forceps. The handle designs allow you to get a lot of apical pressure where you could place the, um, the flat end of the instrument into the palm of your hand. It allows you to hold them properly and get the proper pressure. As Tim discussed, um, they have nice serrations um, on the, the bayonet and the straight and the curved separators, which allows you to um, properly push away the tissue or to make space for the beak of the physics forceps. Uh, lastly, this is another um, set of two instruments that we have as part of the separator series. Um, these are the root tip picks that Dr. Golden's been using for 40 plus years in his practice. Um, some root tip picks out there can be sort of flimsy, uh, don't allow you to get the proper leverage. And these two um, separator root tip kit, uh, root tip uh, picks in our kit here will allow you to uh, properly remove root tips um, when that instance occurs. So we just wanted to mention the set of two quickly here. That's part of the separator series. So as mentioned, um, Golden Dental does have a great regenerative line. Um, I think if you look at our uh, instrumentation that Tim mentioned, um, this kit was developed by, um, by Dr. Krasinski. It's a basic kit. Um, it's not expensive. It has everything you need uh, for anybody that's starting to get into grafting or if you maybe want to have a graph kit that's all ready to go in its own cassette. Our allograph, osteogen, EpiGuide pricing, it's all very, very competitive. Um, I challenge anybody that's using another 
um, allograft brand or a different type of bone material um, to take a look at our pricing. Um, I think you'll find it to be uh, very, very, very competitive, especially if you're going to add on the discount code that I'll mention here in a moment. Um, you really can't beat the price on some of the bone products we do offer. So beyond the pricing, though, it also is a great quality product. Um, Dr. Krasinski uses it. Lots of other people use our products, of course, with great success. Um, they're high-quality materials, and it's not just based on a product um, that has a low price. So last thing I'll mention here before we get into the questions, there's a lot of questions, is um, we do offer, um, we're, we're using the name Amplify for our dental training. Um, we have a lot of live patient um, CE programs that we offer here in Detroit. Um, we just uh, actually will be releasing our 2017 dates um, this week. We do have them, but we have not um, put them up on the site yet. But anyways, we have about seven or eight programs um, planned for next year for our level one program, which is just extractions and simple grafting. And when I mean simple grafting, it's more of the um, extraction and then osteogen plug. And then we have a level two program, which is more advanced grafting, um, where you're still working on live patients, but allows you to extract the tooth and then go back and um, obviously do the grafting component um, in a more advanced manner than you would in our level one program. So here's just a couple of photos. Here's the clinic floor, um, great facility. Um, you have your own chair and working space. Uh, all the patients are provided by us. It really is a, a top-notch program. And if anybody was interested in that, they can learn a little bit more about it um, on our website or obviously give us a call. Uh, love to have you in Detroit. Um, it's definitely worth the trip. Um, here's Dr. Krasinski just working with a couple patients in our program we had um, just a few weeks ago um, at the University of Detroit. So special offers. So for anybody that wanted to take advantage of our products. Um, this is the first one I'll go over that um, isn't gonna apply to anybody that maybe already has our instrumentation, but we believe in our product. Uh, we know it works, we hear the feedback daily, um, the product works. It's worth trying. We have a, a promotional offer for anybody that does not own the physics forceps. If you wanna try our standard series, we let you try them for a dollar. We believe in the product, we know you'll keep it. You got 30 days to try the product. You simply pay a dollar in the shopping cart. And then on top of that, if you decide to keep it, you still get the discount pricing, which I'm gonna talk about in a moment, um, which is 15% which is off of any of our products. So you can try it for a dollar and you still get the discount pricing. If anybody wants to take advantage of that, it's, it's a no brainer if you've been thinking about the product, not sure you believe it, wanna see how it works in your own hands, Simply select the standard series set on our website, use promo code TRY1. So it's T-R-Y and the numeric number one. For anybody else, um, maybe already had some of our products, uh, want to take advantage of some of our bone products, try the Epi Guide, see how the Astrogen works for you. Um, we have a 15% discount on any products we have on our website, anything discussed this evening by using the promotional code of SAVE15. So it's S-A-V-E-1-5. So these are good specials, 15% off, even better than we do at a lot of the trade shows. Um, we do them for 24 hours. So you have till tomorrow evening to take advantage of these specials. Um, we encourage you to give us a call here in the office or visit physicsforceps.com. Um, great deals, try for a buck, can't go wrong, or say 15 on our products. Um, it makes our bone pricing even more competitive than it already was. So I'll go ahead and leave this um, up on the slide and we'll start to get to the, um, we got a lot of questions that everybody submitted and um, let me start trying to get through these, okay? Um, I guess Tim, it says, uh, in the first case, you showed a dilacerated root. Um, are you using a longer implant um, in a case like that? Uh, yeah, great, great question. Yeah, and and what I was trying to demonstrate, maybe I wasn't really really clear, was the the dilaceration went towards the facial aspect, which caused the dehiscence, and so my implant placement is on the palatal aspect. 
I'm not ever putting my immediate implant directly into the socket because that bone is too thin. So if if you saw the if you remember the the uh, CBCT post-operative after the implant was placed, the implant was was placed palatally, but also longer than the socket site, which gives us that initial stability of the implant. Okay, perfect. Um, let's see if I put this question together here. They're talking about um, does elevating the flap change your game plan? Do you expect resorption with flap flap elevation? Um, that yeah, that, that's that's a, that's another great question. It, it's important. The reason we flap is number one, we have to be able to see the defect. It's just like a root canal. When when you can see the canals, the the procedure becomes fairly routine. And as dentists, we have a tendency to tendency to baby the tissue, and so we we're not properly um, protecting whatever we're trying to protect our, our graft material. So um, you you saw in my technique, I try to do an envelope flap. We didn't really have any vertical incisions, um, and that allowed me to have really good control of that tissue. The membrane itself, when we had the facial defect, becomes the facial wall uh, with our graft material. So you have to accept, expect some resorption, but you're not going to get the dramatic resorption uh, as if we didn't graft at all. So even if we're not doing immediate implants, Kurt, it's important that we protect that facial plate of bone. The, the bone will grow. It, it will not grow any further out than the than the uh, height of the bone on either side of a space. So we're not going to we're not going to be able to widen the bone, but we are going to be able to keep it from sinking in and becoming concave. Okay, great. Um, the, the next question. There's a couple questions about um, you know immediate loading. I know um, it, it says you commonly. Uh, immediately place, but but I guess what they're asking for your opinion on the um, immediate loading. Yeah, you know you know that that's an interesting concept because you know there's a lot of lectures out there. Personally, I've been doing implants for 32 years now, Kurt. I, I have never been a big immediate load guy. Now the literature will be very clear on um, when you get initial stability, a certain amount of torque. I don't want to get too too definitive here, but when we get 25 newton centimeters of torque, we can actually place a, a, what's called a healing abutment, which will penetrate through the tissue so that we have one surgical procedure. Um, we don't have to, to cut the patient, numb the patient, and cut the patient again to expose an implant. If we get to 35 newton centimeters of torque, theoretically, the literature will say we can immediately load it, meaning we can put some type of transitional appliance on top. I just, you know, I've, I've, I've done this a long time with, with so many different implant types. I just never really understood the big rush in doing that. And when I did, I did lose significantly more implants than I would like. So <clears throat> I try not to discuss immediate load so much. We do a lot of immediate placement. We do a lot of one-stage procedures. But that's just not my style and what I feel most comfortable doing. Okay, great. Um, when you use the osteogen plug, um, how long do you normally wait uh, for healing uh, to place an implant? That's a great question too. Um, what's nice about the osteogen plug is it's radiolucent up upon placement, and over a period of time, it'll become uh, more opaque, like the natural bone. I would say minimal four months, usually about five months. I never let any any graft heal longer than six months before I um, will place something into it. Okay, and then there's there's a couple. I can answer this one, um, Tim. There's there's a couple questions about cost for the osteogen plugs. I, yeah, normal pricing, they're about fifty dollars each, um, so it's yeah pretty affordable. Um, Pretty affordable product, especially if you, if you layer on the um, the discount pricing too. Um, I guess it makes it in, in the mid forty range, forty five dollars. I don't know, somewhere around that range. So some people are asking on the pricing. Um, there's some other questions about 
uh, the membrane, which which is the epi guide. I, I guess they're asking if it's cost competitive, and then what is the name of the membrane you use to cover the immediate implant case? Um, I don't know, Tim. I guess I can answer that. I mean, it's called Epi Guide. Um, I, I think that's the one that you showed in every case this evening. Um, as far as being cost competitive, um, yeah, I think it's a it's a fair price membrane. It's a huge membrane. It's it's 18 by 30, um, so it obviously allows you the the opportunity to cut it in half. Um, it's a it's a, it's a big membrane, and I think if you're looking at pricing, you obviously have to also compare the size. Um, size to size aspect from from other membranes you may be using. The, right. the epi guide is a polylactic acid that's bioresorbable. It's a synthetic material and it has three layers to it. Um, and it the reason I like it, Kurt, and number one in a program like this, I wanted to keep things simple because it lasts so long and is resorbable. It kind of does the function of both a shorter acting resorbable and a long acting non resorbable membrane trying to keep things um, simple uh, for, for our doctors here tonight all right um, just reading a couple of questions here um, I guess we can get into this a little bit some people have asked about surgical guides um, I mean do you use surgical guides uh, often, or it says um, I, specifically, they might have been asking about a case. It looks like. So, did you use a surgical guide when placing the canine more palatally? That was for the. I first did not. Case. You know, I, I I did not. You know, again, I have a lot of experience. I've been doing this a long time. I've placed over twelve thousand implants, um, and so um, what's nice about CBCT analysis is we're able to virtually place our implants before we ever touch the patient, and. Um, with this, these tools, um, I think it makes us all equal, right? Because we're able to virtually design cases um, before we ever touch the patient. So my experience doesn't really matter. Um, and so we can take it one step further and create a, a surgical guide which will help us in, in the um, um, placement of our implants most ideally. But I would, I would challenge those out there that uh, just because we fabricate a surgical guide, it's not a panacea it's not a hundred percent accurate and um, just be, be very conscious of the cases that you're choosing and know your anatomy and um, you know understand that there are going to be situations that um, uh, you have a surgical guide and we still miss what we think we where we want to place the implant and you have to feel comfortable for doing implants you have to feel comfortable doing atraumatic extractions you have to be comfortable making a flap and controlling the tissue, and you have to be, feel comfortable grafting the site because things happen uh, in, in, in daily life. But yeah, I mean, uh, CBCT and, and guides are, are a wonderful adjunct to everything we do, and it, it basically makes us all, all equal um, in, in the surgical protocol. Great question. Okay, a couple quick questions to ask you, Jen. Basically, somebody says, I have very little grafting experience. Um, you know, could I implement the Astrogen plug? Um, easily, and then also, um, do you need a membrane for the astrogen plug? And, and that's a great question. You know, I, I hate to use the word easy, but um, um, when you have all the walls intact, so there, there, there's all, all there's a facial wall. I think an astrogen plug is a wonderful adjunct to your armamentarium because you're simply placing it in and suturing over the top. You know, for somebody like that, Kurt, I would strongly recommend. You know, come come to one of our courses. And you will become very, very proficient um, in, in using all the materials that we talked about tonight. All right. Just to, since you mentioned the CE program, there's a couple questions on that. Somebody asked about, I'm a Canadian dentist. Could, can I come to the program? The, the answer is yes. You just have to have a U.S. or Canadian license. Um, how many teeth do you normally extract with the programs? You know, we like to, it's definitely no less than 10. <laughs> it's probably more in the 20 range. Um, it just depends. Uh, we normally the 85 plus patients and there's there's absolutely the opportunity to take out um, you know, probably as many teeth as you want to keep you busy for the whole day. Um, the, the patients are there. It just depends on how aggressive you are and how how efficient you're moving through the patient flow that we um, we provide for you. Um, 
All right, I guess um, yeah, I'll respect everybody's time here. I'll go through, let me see here. I'll, I guess there's a couple more questions. Uh, there's a couple on the physics forceps. Um, somebody mentioned, uh, can you explain again the holding process for for, for the physics forceps? Um, I, I don't have a lot of hand strength or I had a hand injury. Um, you know, how, how would that work for me as far as um, it's the whole perfect, perspective? It's, it's just a perfect instrument, Kurt, because it, it takes no strength. There's no forearm, there's no bicep, there's no shoulder pressure. You're not squeezing the instrument, you're simply rotating your wrist, creating pressure onto that palatal or lingual aspect of the tooth. So for somebody who has um, uh, issues with strength, um, I think it's a wonderful tool. And again, I would strongly recommend, because there, it is, it is, there is a learning curve to it, uh, let's be honest. Come in, spend a day with us in Detroit, take out 20 teeth, and learn the protocol correctly. And I think you're, you're way ahead of, ahead of the curve. Okay, great. Yeah, and then for everybody also, I, did, I didn't mention, um, the product obviously comes with a, um, a, a really great training DVD. Um, Dr. Dr. Krasinski is on it quite a bit to explain the technique further. Um, so it does come with instructions. So it's not just instruments in a box. It, there's a great, like, two hours long of going through clinical cases, giving you tips. Um, but for the most part, most people get it right away. But like Tim said, there is a little bit of a, a learning curve with the product. And for any reason, if anybody's not happy with it, you know, there's there's 90 days. Uh, there's there's always 90 days on our product. And if um, if it's not for you, it's not for you. All right. Well, I guess I'll um, I think I, there's a couple other questions, but we'll probably just answer those um, through email if that's okay. I want to respect everybody's time this evening and. Um, again, uh, if anybody wants to take advantage of the specials, you know, we're here. We're here tomorrow. Give us a call. If any questions, we're happy to answer them. And um, thanks, Dr. Krasinski. I appreciate everybody's time this evening, and I uh, hope you can join us again for a future webinar. Thanks, Good everybody. Night, everybody.